bit of work we've been doing on legged locomotion and particularly looking at the power actuation and performance systems of these. Uh, I want to do essentially a, a compare and comparison between two of the robots we've been using. One is a, a, a bipedal robot, one is a quadrupedal robot. They use uh, very different technologies um, and I just want to do a little bit of a comparison between those to actually see what, which has advantages, disadvantages, what they can do, what they can't do. So, oops. yep, there we go. One too many. There we go. Okay, so initially, just a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to present. I uh, want to look at why legged locomotion. Um, there's a lot of questions about this. Many of the things possibly we can do with wheels and with tracks. So why using legged locomotion? And then particularly focusing on actuator technologies. I just low light pneumatics, just to actually say that we've done pneumatics in the past, to point out a little bit of what we've actually done. But what we'll be focusing on here are actuator technologies around both hydraulic and uh, electric, and looking particularly at how we can use those in compliant actuation, which was a characteristic of the pneumatics that we did before. And then looking at some performance in two different robots, in particular the HiQ robot, which is a hydraulic quadruped, and in the Coman robot, uh, which is a compliant humanoid. And then maybe if time permits, we'll have a little bit of a look at some of the newer technologies we hope to incorporate into our latest um, humanoid robot, which is called Walkman. Okay, so what these videos are designed to do is to show you a comparison of wheels and tracks and legs. And in the top, you can see a typical track vehicle up here, uh, okay, which is struggling with a not very large hole. And here you can see a very large wheeled vehicle, which is struggling quite a lot with not particularly difficult steps. Underneath, what you will actually see, oh, sorry, the, let's try again. Okay, underneath, what you will actually see is that the legged systems can cope with a wide variety of terrain. They go across country, they can turn very quickly. The dog is somewhat remarkable. It was actually trained along with um, people who did climbing and the dog didn't want to be left out, so the dog learns to climb. So you can do remarkable things with legs. But with wheels and with tracks, un unless the terrain is very flat, we can struggle with even comparatively simple um, operations. I mean, you can see these, this truck has very large wheels and the actual steps that are go it's going up are not so large, okay, whereas the dog has quite short legs and doesn't seem to have any problem, using its head, of course, as well. So what we actually find is that legged systems are suited to human-engineered environments and to unnatural terrains or to natural terrains. Legged systems are very versatile and agile. They adapt to various different terrain and obstacles. And animals have a great efficiency, which doesn't actually exist in um, traditional robotic-type designs. This is, again, to give you an idea of why we don't use legs. Uh, and the reason we don't use legs is because with humans, we fall over very easily, and robots fall over very easily. Um, and sometimes it's not too pleasant. Uh, I use this, this example on ice because it's actually more natural. It's very difficult to find real examples of people falling over on a, on a normal terrain. We don't tend to slip naturally. But you can see some of the responses that we actually do. So legs are a very difficult thing to actually, to actually deal with. This is why we don't typically go for robots with legs. It, it's hard to keep the balance. Okay, so what's the motivation? We want the creation of a versatile, highly dynamic, autonomous, all-terrain robot. That's what we'd like to achieve. Essentially, we want to be able to do what, what we can do with people, able to step across these stones quite easily. What a cat, I mean, this is amazing what goats can actually do, dogs, the types of, types of things. We want to be able to put our robots into dangerous environments, disaster scenarios. We want to be able to put our robots into environments which are human engineered, so process plants, um, into large scientific establishments, synchrotrons, uh, these types of environments. And we want to be able to put them into countryside to be able to do farming and forestry, et cetera, et cetera. So these are maybe domains we can use. What we actually find is we want to replace or to assist people in dangerous, dull, dirty tasks. So what we got, there's been a lot of work on various different types of 
humanoid, all types of legged robots over a large number of years. This is just a, an example of some of them. There are many, many more. So if some of your robots are not included here, my apologies. Um, in terms of looking at the robot, there are essentially three ways we can power them, pneumatically, hydraulically, electrically. Uh, and I want to look a little bit at each of these technologies and how they can actually be used for robots. I'll start off by looking at pneumatics, which is something that we, we did a long time ago and haven't done in recent times, but just to give you some idea of what can be achieved with pneumatic systems and also what maybe would be limitations. So this is some work which I actually had done back about 10, nearly 15 years ago. Uh, and what we can actually see um, is a quadruped, pneumatic quadruped using pneumatic muscles, um, which we'd worked on for quite a long time. These were very nice, they were very compliant, they did lots of things. This was back in the days when compliance was considered as a bad thing. Now compliance is considered as a good thing, but in these days compliance was considered as a bad thing because it took away accuracy. Uh, so what we have is a quadruped robot, we have a bipedal humanoid, we have a mixture, this is a gorilla robot, which is able to go on four legs, on two legs, um, and then the one at the bottom was actually an exoskeleton, a leg exoskeleton, which we'd actually done for rehabilitation. This was for the legs, but we also had versions which we used for the arms. Um, and here you can actually see, you can actually do many of the things that we want to do. The pneumatic version of the robot was able to cope, was able to walk very slowly, difficult to balance. Pneumatics was difficult to control, but we could do it. Um, the quadruped was able to walk, again, slowly. It didn't have that really dynamic motion. It wasn't because the pneumatics wasn't fast, but because we typ typically couldn't control them at really high speeds. And so we also looked, we moved on to look at different types of uh, other types of actuation. We looked at hydraulic actuation, we looked at pneumatic actuation, and these are the two robots we were considering. The HiQ robot on the left, the quadruped, and the Coman robot. One's a quadruped, one's a biped. Allows us to compare two-leg motion against four-leg motion. One is electric, one is hydraulic. It allows us to compare hydraulics against electrics to see the advantages, the disadvantages, where one's good, one, where one's less good. One is completely actively compliant, so we use um, the torque sensors and force sensors to control it. The other, the, the battery's gone. Uh, the Coman robot has a combination of active compliance in every joint plus passive compliance in about three quarters of the joints. Um, so we'll go on, and what I want to go on to is to look at what we've actually learned during the development of these particular types of robots, what the advantages and disadvantages. So those of you who study robotics will have read the textbooks, and this is hydraulics. And this is the advantages from a standard textbook and the disadvantages from a standard textbook. And I'd like to suggest some truths and some myths. Okay, most people who do robotics come from an electrical engineering background, maybe a mechanical engineering, but most people hate hydraulics. Okay, they don't like hydraulic systems at all. So, what we have are all these negatives, these disadvantages. And the ones I've crossed out are because with our experience of hydraulics, these are not true. They were written in a book in the 1980s when somebody was trying to justify using electric motors, but in actual fact, most of this is not true. Um, the leakage affects performance and contaminates workspace. We've had the robot operational for two to three years, barely a sign of leakage. Doesn't have to leak. Badly maintained robots, they leak. Well maintained robots don't leak. So that's not, not really true. Uh, less reliable than electric robots? Well, I would have to say that our hydraulic robot is much more reliable than our electric robot, okay? The difficulty is that people are often comparing not like with like, so you can actually compare a hydraulic robot quite favorably with an electric robot. You can take an excavator outside and you can work it in a construction site day in, day out for years with relatively little maintenance and it still works. You take an electric, electric system outside and do that, it's very unlikely it survives. So the reliability issue, dependent. The power pack can be noisy. Well, the power pack we use is about as noisy as the air conditioning in this room. So at night time when you're trying to get to sleep, you probably turn the air conditioning off but during the day, most people are not bothered about it. It's relatively expensive. Yeah, it is relatively expensive, and so are the actuators that we actually, the electric actuators we use. In fact, the hydraulics is marginally cheaper than the electrics. Depends what you're comparing in terms of like with like. Um, cost is not proportional to size. That one probably is true. Servo control is complex, not widely understood. It can be complex, and it's not widely understood but we will actually shall show you in some of the videos later that you can actually control a hydraulic robot just as effectively as you can control an electric robot. 
Filtering to remove impurities, you do need filtering to remove impurities, it's not a big issue. Put a filter in, job done. Okay, nothing to worry about. Pipe piping is awkward to install. Yeah, the piping traditionally has been awkward to install, but what you can actually do, and what we've actually been doing with some of our, our um, recent robots, is doing additive technology where we actually construct the, the pipes inside the robot, and then there's no pipes at all. It's actually built inside, you have internal wiring. There's no pipes, there's no awkwardness in it. Fire is a potential hazard. Yep, if you use mineral oil, fire is a potential hazard. There's absolutely no reason to use mineral oil. In fact, mineral oil is not a good material to use. There are much better materials, there are much better fluids to use than mineral oil, and they perform better, and they don't go on fire. And power pack takes up floor space, and so does whatever you use for electric systems. What we have is some sort of bias against hydraulic and pneumatic systems where we say we need a power supply for those. But you also need a power supply for electric system. You only need batteries or you actually need your power station, and they're quite big. But these were the two pluses that people always picked out, and they are actually still true. High power to weight ratio, high power to size ratio, and better at withstanding shock loadings. They don't break easily, don't break gearboxes and whatever, and those, those truths still hold. So we, have, we can dispel many of the disadvantages, and we can actually still have the advantages. So, hydraulics might be a useful thing to actually use. Here we can actually see, is that right? Ah. Here we can actually see um, the quadruped robot we have, it's called Haiku. Uh, it's approximately, stands about this size, about a meter tall, about a meter long, half a meter wide. Depending on the configuration, it weighs in from 60 kilos to just over 100 kilos, depending on whether we have power packs on board, power packs off, and what sensors in, and what systems put onto it. We have 12 degrees of freedom, three degrees of freedom per leg. Each of the legs is powered by a hydraulic actuator, either two hydraulic cylinders and a rotary actuator at the shoulder. The torque, typically about 150 Newton meters. Um, can be a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the how, pressures we actually use, but typically about 150. Various types of sensors, we have joint sensors, torque sensors, IMU, inertial measurement unit, uh, oil pressure sensors, stereo cameras, lidars, et cetera, to pick up external images. In terms of onboard computation, we currently use a PC-104 that's being replaced. Um, we use an Intel i7 processor, Linux, et cetera, et cetera, usual types of things. Uh, control frequency around about one, one kilohertz. This is just to actually show, this just highlights a little bit on the kinematics of the robot. Um, the reason, this is actually the skeleton of a cat. The reason I put this up is because everybody says, why did you build it back to front? Everybody says, why did you put the knees facing backwards or the knees facing forward? And this is to actually show you that in animals, it's actually exactly the same configuration. What we typically don't do is we don't notice that we're actually looking at diff different joints. What is happening is in our robot, we have no foot. And this is the foot. The part on the horse that you actually see is when it's up on its toes like this, it's actually up like this. This is why you think it's got an extra joint. You think this is its knee, this is its knee up here. The two configurations are exactly the same. Uh, what we don't have is, is an actual foot. So that, that's just why I put that, because people always ask that question. This is to actually show the range of motion of the robot. You can see it's fairly high, much larger than you get, typically get with most animals. So you can actually go up to at least 90 degrees at the actual waist. So we get a wide range of motion. In terms of the actual technologies which are inside this robot, we use hydraulic cylinders, okay, um, made by a company called Herberger. We also use rotary uh, actuators. As I say, they're about 150 Newton meters for the cylinders, about 120 to 150 um, on the rotary actuators. Use position sensors. These are just an example of the types of position sensors, lots of different types. Okay, anybody wants details, I can give you details afterwards, but we use lots of different types of sensors on board. And this is the current PC-104 stack which we use, which is now, be, now being replaced. Now this is just to actually show some of the control we can actually get with this robot. Uh, okay, it's hydraulic, then hydraulics can't be controlled. Uh, and what you can actually see at the top is just the actual input sine wave and the tracking sine wave, both in force and in kinematics, uh, sorry, both in force and in torque. Uh, and you can see, we're getting here five hertz. The robot will run, this particular leg will run at about eight. Eight is about its peak before it has a problem. Uh, in truth, we never need to run at five. Two or three is the fastest most animals can move their legs. So two or three is, is the normal. In the bottom, what we, just go back and do a show it again. That's right. 
In the bottom, what we're actually doing is we're actually able to create a virtual dumper, a virtual spring dumper, and so we can actually change the compliance online. So while the robot is operational, we can change it from high dumping to low dumping. So here you can see it's very springy. Uh, we can, while they're operating, we then change it to, uh, can change it to high dumping, and we can do that. We can do that in mid-cycle. So with the robot, when it makes contact with the ground, initially can be low dumping, uh, sorry, um, high compliance to absorb the impact. Then it stiffens the joint during the actual support phase and the push-off phase, and then the swing through air, it can go back to a low compliance. And so we can actually change that. We can change that essentially in real time, faster than the robot can actually run. Okay, and that's one of the things that typically you say you can't actually do, but we, can, we are able to do this. We're able to actually control the interactions. Okay, and so this is to actually show some of the things which we can now do with a hydraulic robot. So that goes through quickly, and then it'll go back a little bit more slowly to actually show what's going on. So this is for a video compiled from a variety of different things. This is just actually showing the robot climbing stairs. What it's actually doing, it uses an external map, so it's an external, it has some external perception to work out where the steps are, then climbs up the steps. Again, in this, in the top left, you can actually see the map that it's built of the environment. Uh, and as the robot steps across, tries to put, if you watch the, the left hind, even when you move the um, brick away, it just adapts to the environment. So it's continuously adapting to the environment. It, it expected to put its foot down. It wasn't there. It continues to move. Here again, it's planning the footholds, using the stereo cameras to build the, the maps. This is outside. This is blind. So there's no cameras on board here. This is the robot just reacting to the environment. So as the robot actually makes contact with the ground, it actually is just reacting. Same type of thing inside. And what you see is sometimes it actually changes its gait because of changes in the terrain. So if the terrain's a little bit awkward, if it's having difficulty, it will actually change its gait. This is just showing the robot actually compensating for various different inputs and hitting against the robot. So this is a, a, a boxing bag weighs, it's full of stones because a normal boxing bag's not heavy enough. So it's got about 23, 25 kilos. Uh, this is Victor falling. Um, it's quite a heavy bag. Uh, so you can actually see this particular video, what's actually, this is the robot genuinely running. Okay. Um, and at this particular fact, the robot is in, in full flight in the air without any springs, which is very important. Any other robot you tend to see tends to have springs. There's no springs. It uses purely its compliance. It's changing its active compliance during the time. This is not a run. This is a walk. It's, this is a, a very fast walk. This is actually showing what happens to the robot when it's no reaction. So it makes it hits a step, it falls, falls forward, as you would step up yourself. But we now put a controller in the uh, top right. You see the traditional uh, hemispherical motion. When you make contact, we change the actual step. And so we actually are able to step up. This robot is able to jump. This is from a long time ago. Uh, this is, again, just showing that. So this is at um, 30 Newton seconds per meter, so it's a quite, a, quite a high dumping, and then, so you see it's absorbing the impacts, and then switch to a low dumping, and now you'll see some more oscillations. And we can switch it backwards and forwards between these. And here we've done the same thing, so instead of just doing it into a leg, what we're actually doing is we're actually changing the stiffness on the knees of the, of the robot. This is showing on the right-hand side, all the actuators have been removed, and this is a physical spring, this is the left-hand side showing the same type of drop test where we are actually emulating a physical spring. And you can see there's a very, very close relationship between the two. In this instance, what the robot is trying to do is one of the people who works on this is a, a very enthusiastic climber. And this is a, a chimney. And he's using the robot. So it's a combination of combining the uh, lateral forces with the vertical forces to make sure the robot doesn't actually fall. So in this particular instance, what this, ro this one is actually doing, this is actually just showing some of the navigation. So here what the robot is actually doing, it's actually keeping fixed on the target in front. When, it actually, when the treadmill actually stops, it will stop mo moving. So this is just actually to show some of the perception that it can actually do. It can spot an external object. If it gets close to an object that it's following, it stops. If it's too slow, what you'll see is it starts walking forward. Yeah. Once it gets further away from the target, it just starts walking forward and starts following it. And if they push it, it always will keep a constant heading. So we do this initially inside on the treadmill, where we can control things very easily. 
Yep, it's gone too far forward. Now it stops because it doesn't want to crash into the, into the beam. This is outside in this particular environment. What's actually happening is it's spotting the object. It wants to go to the red object. It spots, so in this instance, it can see this object. It lifts its legs higher as it comes closer to the object to be able to step over the object. In some, one of the earlier videos where it couldn't see, it actually just tripped over that, but it was able to react to it. So it can either see the objects and step over them when it's got cameras, or if it's completely blind, it just reacts to them and, and stumbles up through the, through the system. So there's a variety of different levels at which the robot can cope with the environment. Here again, you see a higher lift because it's seen an object in front of it. And it can do that purely reactively, but in this instance, it's actually planning for that motion. Okay, hydraulics. Now we want to look at the electric systems and see how they compare. And so we have the typical advantages and disadvantages of an electrical system. And we can see particular things that we need. They're easy to use, the good speed and variability, accurate positional and velocity responses. We can control them easily. They're clean. They're acoustically very quiet. But their disadvantages typically are low power to weight ratio, low torque weight ratio, easily damaged during impacts. Okay? And that's a, an, a, an issue which comes out during the design of this, and if we get a chance, I'll talk a little bit about how we address some of those for our next robot. Okay. I said compliance is one of our big issues. One of the things we wanted to actually do, we've been trying to do over the years, is trying to build compliance into these particular electric systems. We want to improve the interaction safety. We want to make high fidelity force and torque control. We want increased robustness during accidental impacts and deliberate collisions. Uh, we want to increase power, uh, peak power. This is what's something that's suggested in most types of compliance. In truth, it's very seldom achieved, but in, 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 in practice, there's an issue about being able to store energy within a compliance system. Okay, and focus on those. And then current actuators have not demonstrated substantial energy benefits, and I hope we'll get on and get a chance to actually show one or two of the systems we want to do for that. But initially, I want to look at the current robot we're using. This is a, a robot called Coman. It's got 31 degrees of freedom. It's actually slightly more than that now. It's got a hand, and depending on which hand you have, you have about 35 degrees of freedom or 70, um, depending on, on the particular hand you've actually got. But typically, the main robot is about 35 degrees of freedom. All electric motors, it has active compliance in every joint, so it's got torque sensors built into every single joint. It has passive compliance, steering elastic, elastic elements in its ankles, its knees, its hips, its waist, all of the shoulders, so there's actually only two or three joints that don't have passive compliance as well as active compliance. And you can see this typical type of onboard systems. Um, we have about 55 newton meters of torque. At peak, torque is about 55 newton meters. Um, we use a lithium, um, lithium polymer battery, which gives us anywhere up to about two hours of operation, depending on what we, we're actually trying to do. Constructed from aluminium, um, it's about 34, degree, uh, 34 kilos, uh, stands about 1 meter 20 with its head. The head's not on here, but the head's just been designed and built, so, so the, it has, stands, with, stands for the head. It again uses a PC-104, which is being replaced. And the history of this robot, this robot comes through a series of different types of robots. It originally started off as part of an iCub. This is an iCub that most people, you've, some of you have seen the video. This iCub never existed. Okay, this was one that was built, was designed. This is when iCub was supposed to be the size of an 18-month-old child. And so this is a very, very small robot. This is the legs. We designed the legs for this, and this, is, this was built but never put into the robot. We then built the lower body for the iCub, which people will have seen, um, and this is the whole iCub you've seen. This is what we call the C-Cub. This was built in about 2011. This was the compliance. This was the first compliant version of that particular type of robot. In 2012, we modified this particular design, built it into the Coman, um, and this year, later this year, we will actually have the Walkman robot, which is a much bigger robot, about 1 meter 50, 1 meter 60 tall. Okay, key to these particular robots are their actuation. And we're looking at compliant actuation. We have a variety of different types. Uh, we have fixed, 
series elastic uh, actuators, and we have variable stiffness or variable impedance actuators. And these are some of the designs that have been used over the years. Some of the more designs, more in the bottom right, but many designed by various different other, peop uh, other people. And again, if I've missed anybody out, my apologies. Um, what we wanted to do was to include some of these into our robots. And so here we can actually see some of the designs we've actually done. Um, this is a passive module. This is what we actually do, as you'll see, the stiffness can be changed in these two modules. These are series elastic elements. This one is a series elastic element, but it also has variable damping. We actually put uh, a friction damping in here because one of the problems you get with these is they can oscillate. But what we can do here is we can actually control the damping as well. Uh, and it actually allows us to store some energy. So these are the types of actuators which are typically used in the Coman. We can change their stiffness. Uh, I think it goes from 600, I think 30 is the lowest. Um, it actually does in this, does in this particular configuration. Um, but some of the systems we've got can go essentially from zero to infinity. It's not quite infinity. It's, it's from the structural stiffness of the metal up to, to uh, sorry, down to, to almost zero. So we can control the, the damping. We can control the stiffness. What we want to do then is build that into a robot. And so this is Coman. And here we have, it's fully torque controlled. Uh, and here we can actually see, you can see that the upper body is highly compliant. The guys are actually interacting with it completely as you would interact with a, with a human. Um, but the legs are stiff because the legs have to deal with the balance. Uh, so essentially the legs have, have got a much higher stiffness, but the upper body has a low stiffness. And we can do this, we can regulate this, individual joints can have a a stiffness. This is actually showing that if we actually turn it onto a torque control mode, it becomes frictionless or essentially frictionless. Uh, and so here it behaves just like a, as, as a pendulum. As it stands, we can actually have a stabilization controller. So what you actually see is a number of different, th you see here, it's using its arms as a human would. So as you push, your arms go backwards. It uses motion in its knees, sorry, its knees, its hips, um, its hips, its knees, and its ankles. It uses motion in its arms. It uses all of these different strategies to actually control its balance. And it can use this dynamically, so if it's on an environment where the, the floor is actually moving, what it's doing is adjusting it. It doesn't matter whether the, the surface on which it's actually moving is level. It can adapt to that. It's got force torque sensors built into each of its joints, so its leg, two, that's force torque sensor in each leg, uh, force torque sensor in its arm, as well as the torque sensors. You can actually cause disturbances during typical type of motion. Um, and you can see, it's partly you can disturb it, but also it's safe for the people to be close to it. Okay, and this is just actually showing some of the impedance control. And so what we can actually do, this is with the impedance controller turned on. What we, uh, the numbers are a bit small there to say, um, my apologies, I should have checked that. Um, you can change the stiffness, you can change the, the dumping, you can change these in real time, so you can have whatever characteristics of the robot. You can have one arm stiff and the other arm very compliant, the legs very stiff while the arms are compliant. You can change these backwards and forwards. And then what we can do with this, is we can also build this into some of the balance controllers. So here we can actually see with the impedance controller turned off, the, the robot bounces, it oscillates. There's no stabilization because it's not got the compliance. But once we turn the, the impedance controller on, we can start to change its characteristics. So here it's got high dumping. You, let it, you release it, it will go back very slowly. It's heavily dumped. We can change that, and so we can change the characteristics, all of its balance characteristics, all of the way it actually operates. We can change all of these essentially in real time. So we're able to explore various different aspects of, of balance uh, configuration. So here we have it with a low impedance. And it goes into an oscillatory cycle. Okay. And one of the things we can actually then explore is what are the best values to choose? How do we select? the impedance values to actually make the robot behave more effectively. Okay. Of course, humanoid robots have got to walk. 
Uh, and we do make the robot walk. We don't spend a lot of time actually exploring walking in this. The Japanese are, are very good. The Asimo robot is one of the best. It walks, it runs. There's not significant value in us actually pursuing that because their robots, which are stiff robots, are extremely good at doing that. What we're particularly interested in is, the, is in, the, in the interaction when it's, the ground's unstable, when the robot interacts with people. So this is just to actually show the robot can walk. Same as any robot. It can walk up slopes, which is a much more difficult thing to do. Um, I did have a, there is a video of it going from a flat to a slope, but I haven't been able to find that. I forgot to bring that with me. Um, but this is a 15 degree of slope, which apparently is, um, I was talking to the people who designed the Asimo, apparently Asimo will do 10. Um, so this is actually quite a steep slope for a robot. I didn't realize this, I only found this out last week. Um, so 15 degrees is quite a steep slope for a robot to actually, actually be going up. Then we can do various different types of balance. So we saw some of these at the top. You see the arms adjusting as we actually make impacts, the arms, the legs. If you look on the top right, what you actually see is another strategy is when somebody pushes you, if you can't balance like this, eventually you take a step. Okay, so the top right shows that. The bottom right shows the, step beyond, the, the, the sequence beyond that. If somebody pushes you too hard and the step's no good, eventually you reach out to grab hold of something. So these are a series of different strategies we have to deal with disturbances, to, to deal with balance. You can, you can just use your arms to balance. You can use your legs and your arms to balance. You can actually take a step to balance. Or in the extreme, you take a step and you reach out to grab hold of an object. So there's a variety of different types of balance strategies. And we can incorporate all of these into this particular type of robot. And we can teleoperate this robot. Um, one of the things we wanted to actually do was to see if it's possible. So here we can see Anis is, what she's actually doing is she's got various trackers and as she actually moves, the robot actually just copies her. Uh, and this is a, an, uh, a design in wearable haptics and the idea is that the robot will actually track her until the robot does something which it doesn't want to do and then it informs her. There's, some, there's a haptic device, a little vib, uh, vibration device, which will actually tell her it's too far. So initially what you see is just teleoperation. Okay, but it's teleoperation of a humanoid robot, so it's teleoperating all the, the degrees of freedom. Uh, and here, what she's actually doing is just controlling the arms, so she can reach out for various different things. And then what happens in the next bit is that she will lean forward or she will lean backwards. When she leans backwards, the robot overbalances. So initially it overbalances and falls. Then in the, the next sequence, so up here, she's leaning forward, the robot will overbalance and fall because it's just tracking what she's doing. Okay, so the robot falls over. It doesn't fall, it gets caught, but it's overbalanced at that point. At this particular point, what's actually happening is when the robot gets to that point where it, it knows that it's going to overbalance. It sends a signal to her, and unfortunately it's haptics, you just have to believe it sends a signal to her. But it sends, it sends a vibratory signal to her, and she stops moving. So she knows without the robot actually seeing, without her seeing the robot, without any information, she's able to, to teleoperate that to work out when the robot is about to, to overbalance. And she does that to the forwards, do the same thing when she, go, when she leans backwards. Uh, this was just to, to show Usually, and in the next videos, I'll show a very simple hand, a soft hand, which has been developed at IIT in conjunction with uh, PISA by Antonio Bicchi. Um, and this is a soft hand which is, is very robust. It's a single, um, single motor working on the, the first synergy. So it gives us 85% of what we want, but it's a very uh, simple device, very robust device. This is a 22 degree of freedom hand. We can build a 22 degree of freedom hand but I'm not sure if it pounds back, but if you see it, you will see a phenomenal number of motors in the forearm and everything. It's a very, very heavy weight to carry, and you end up with a, a very heavy structure with a relatively weak wrist. So it's great, it does everything, got all the motions you got in the hands, but it's not ideal for fitting onto a humanoid robot, in my opinion, at this time. This is just looking at some combined tasks. Um, this is a door opening task. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't take too long. So what the, the robot's actually doing here, it's actually using, in this instance, it's using a, a Kinect um, sensor. Uh, and so this is the image, it actually has an image of the door, it spots where the door handle is. 
uh, works out where the center of rotation of the door handle is. It's already worked out where the center of rotation of the door is. And now it will go through a sequence of events to actually open the door. Um, and we all think it's a relatively simple thing to do to walk through the doors because we do it every day. But if you actually start programming robots to do this, this becomes, you realize it's actually very difficult to do, particularly if you consider that the door is weighted. You have to hold the door. So it'll open the door in a second. So this is the soft hand. The, the hand you see there is the soft hand which developed by Antonio. So the robot has to work out where the center of rotation of the handle is partly by vision, but also by, the, by working out the force and by the compliance. It's then got to reach out and prevent the door from closing. The door has a level of spring, so the door will actually spring back. So it's actually got to hold on to the door at all times, or else the door will close on it. So it uses the second hand to do this. And now it has to maneuver itself around while holding that. What we would probably do is we'd use our hand, we'd just throw the door back and walk through very quickly. Um, and that's a strategy, um, which a robot could use, but then you've got to move quite quickly dur during that motion. Uh, yes, yeah, so just showing the process, just the robot holding the door, and then it's got to maneuver around the door, and then through the space. So it does that. Another task it's recently been trying to do is to turn a valve. Some of you may recognize these tasks. Um, this is a valve turning operation, and so what the robot has to do here has to spot the valve itself, where the valve is, the center of rotation of the valve, and then use the compliance within the robot to be able to control its center of rotation. And all the time it's doing this, of course, it's got to maintain its balance. So by using the vision system, it works out approximately where the center of rotation of the valve is. By using the compliance, the torque sensors in the arm, it's able to actually work out where there are uneven forces and actually able to balance that for the turning. Uh, I'm just not. OK, this is actually showing the image. This is um, partly teleoperative, so semi-autonomous. The, the operator tells, it, tells the robot when it's OK to go ahead and do something, so it's autonomous in that. But it doesn't do anything without checking with the operator. So there's a, there's a mixed autonomy within this. OK, it just goes on like this. Now, what I wanted to do, one of the things, if you remember back a little bit, I talked about the fact that the uh, power weight ratio you get from electric motors and their performance, their robustness, is a little suspect compared to what you actually get with hydraulics. And what we want to do with the Walkman robot, which is in the new European project, um, is to develop different types of, of actuators. And so this is a new actuator which we've designed, uh, which will be used in the Walkman. Uh, it's got 900 watts continuous power up to three, near, just under three kilowatts peak power. Uh, it actually gives it, it, it weighs about uh, just under two kilos. So it gives it about one and a half kilowatts per kilo um, peak power, which is uh, probably about 10 times higher than we actually get from the Coman. It uses a gearing ratio of 50 to 1. Uh, with that gearing ratio, we get a peak torque of 210 Newton meters. If you remember when we looked at the HiQ, it was about, a, so the hydraulic robot was about 150 Newton meters. The Coman robot was 55 Newton meters. At 210 Newton meters, we can still achieve 14 radians per second. So we can still, still at that speed, we can achieve a very, very, very fast uh, motion. Um, it uses, uh, High-speed um, absolute encoders. It doesn't. In the previous version with Coman, we actually used torque, torque sensors to actually do the encoding. Now we actually use these high-resolution high absolute encoders to actually work out the um, uh, torques on the joints. And we can do the same things as we did with the other robots. We can actually, uh, with the other joints, we can actually control their stiffness. So this is just actually showing it, showing it, controlling its stiffness. We can actually change its stiffness. We can actually change its, its um, compliance during the, in real time during the operation. Um, and this robot is strong enough that, that a person can actually sit on that. Um, we've had somebody sitting on it. And it will actually sit, they will sit on it and it will actually lift them. Um, so it's an incredibly powerful motor. And we've then incorporated that into a new type of knee design, um, which instead of being a series elastic actuator, is a parallel um, uh, actuation system. 
and this is the actual design itself. It's, it's not a serious, it's actually got a variable impedance, so you can actually have a, a second motor, so you can actually can change the, the actual stiffness uh, in real time during the actual motion. And with this particular system, what we can get is some of the performance, maybe most of the performance we get with a hydraulic system. So we can change in real time its actual impedance characteristics. And if you watch, sometimes you'll see the motor up here just changing, and during that motion, it's actually changing the stiffness of the joints. So you see a tensioning and retensioning of the actual joint. During the actual motion, you can see it's got 15 kilos. There's actually 15 kilo weight on the upper force, but there the person is actually putting more forces onto it. Uh, and what you can see is it's robust to impacts because usually you wouldn't get this. You wouldn't do a drop test on an electric system because the gears would smash, which we actually did do in Coleman, and the gears smashed. Um, and you see it drops, which is very similar to what you get from the hydraulic system. And another advantage from this is that during the operations, because of the tension operations, we can recycle up to 75% of the energy. So you actually get a 75% reduction in the actual uh, power, uh, power requirement for this particular moment. When it's an oscillatory, when it's doing, it, doing something repetitive, so when it's running, when it's walking, et cetera, you can, act, you can actually get very, very high uh, energy regeneration. So it's very, it can be very, very efficient. If you're doing one-off steps, that's a different thing. But if you actually were walking or if you were running, you end up with something which is very efficient or potentially very efficient. One of the other things that we've actually been doing and will be built into this particular robot is a KERS system, the kinematic, uh, kinetic energy regeneration systems that you have on Formula One cars. Uh, and so we can actually build that into these particular motors. Um, and what we can actually do, uh, okay, this just, just shows. Depending on the cycles, in the best case scenario, we regenerate 75% of the energy. In a typical, oops, in a typical cycle, um, which is going from here through to here, which is a much more typical cycle, we regenerate 20%. So we can get a regeneration of anything from 20 to 75%, depending on what we actually do. So this, again, it's a much stronger design, much, more, much higher power, but also with much more efficiency. Um, we plan to use new materials. We use carbon uh, fibers. We do additive manufacturing. And I hope I'm not too badly on time. Uh, just to acknowledge some of the people. This is not everyone, but this is the, some of the group which works on the Coman and Walkman robot. And these are some of the guys who are actually working on the HiQ. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darwin. Um, questions? The initial uh, robots that you show, the hydraulic ones, um, how are they powered? Are they powered, you have an electric, those cables were providing electric power to them? Uh, it depends. Uh, on, in some versions, we use like, external hydraulic power. So we just take, the cables are actually hydraulic. In some versions, there is an onboard electric motor which drives a pump. So it can be hydraulic externally. It can be electric driving an onboard pump, so we just have an electric cable. And in the newer version we're actually looking at, it will have an internal combustion engine to make it uh, onboard. But with the electric version, in theory, we've never done it. In theory, we can put batteries in there and run it off the batteries. Uh -huh. um, the reason you don't do that is hydraulics tends to be very inefficient. And if you run it off batteries, you need a lot of batteries for a relatively uh, short amount of time. But we, we can do any of those options are open to us. Depends. In the lab, we typically run it off an external hydraulic supply. When we take it outside, sometimes we run it off its, own, its onboard power supply. And would that provide enough power to get it going? I mean, did you try it on those difficult terrains? Oh, yeah, yeah. We've had, it we've had it outside in car parks. Because outside, it works perfectly well in car parks. Um, so it goes, it goes outside, it, it works. The, the electric motor which drives it is 8 kilowatts. It's enough power. Uh -huh. Thank you. So thank you, great, great talk. But my question is, 
Um, so the one is we have like a, a, a biomorphic robotics mm -hmm. right, project. Yeah. So like in this case. On the other hand, there are differences between what the biology has engineered yeah. through evolution and what you're building. So, so could, you, could you maybe explain in a bit more detail what are, in your opinion, really the, the biological principles, the biomechanical principles that you adhere to, the actuation principles that you think carry over in this technology, and where do you believe you really have to sort of invent new ones? So we'll, okay. okay. So if we, if we look at the pneumatic technology, which I, I did in the past, that is macroscopically, it's very similar to muscle. It, it changes, it, it actually bulks out during the characteristics. In, in terms of the microscopic technology, there's nothing. But microscopically, it's very similar. You work as antagonistic pairs, so it's, it's very like the biological system. If you look at the hydraulics and the electrics, and let's, let's think of the electrics first of all. With the electric system, one of the things which we believe is very important is this ability to be able to change the compliance. Historically, robots have been rigid systems, totally unlike humans. If the robots are going to interact with people, humanoid robots really need to be able to do that, then they need this compliance, they need this safety. Um, in theory, this gives us more energy. Okay? In, in practice, what we've actually seen with the new design actually allows us to store energy, regenerate energy to make things more efficient. But how we build it? No. There's no comparison. So what actually happened is that the concept of compliance, the concept of energy storage, the concept of being able to change your compliance, these are great ideas. But to try and build them as biological systems into the robots, this technology doesn't exist with the robustness we need at the time. When we first started looking at the, the original iCub, um, we talked about using pneumatics, we talked about using electrics, we talked about using hydro, all, a variety of different types of actuator technology. And in the end, we went for electric systems because that's what everybody knew and that's what was reliable and that's what we could make the robot work. Since then, we've moved on, we've done different things. Um, so I'm not saying that other technologies won't be valuable. What I'm saying is, at the minute, these are the technologies which, which work effectively. But we can take the biological principles. There's a lot of really nice biological compliance is really nice. Energy storage is really nice. Um, if we could make soft robots, if we could make them soft, this would be a big advantage. Um, but, but at the minute, hydraulics and electrics aren't soft. Pneumatics, maybe. So uh, two questions, kind of related to one another, though. Um, what you talked about some motivations in the beginning. Um, so I'm wondering what you suspect are the, f you know, f out of the lab easiest type application areas, um, and then kind of in line with that, what uh, kinds of uh, scaling considerations there are for making these, making more of these. I mean, are, have you thought in ter a little more long term in terms of manufacturing, scaling, and things okay. like that, or is it extremely manual, uh, it's labor intensive? To manufacture the, I'll start answer the second question yeah. first. To answer the, um, the robots are fairly, they're labor intensive to make. It takes about, from, from components, from ordering the components to building, to, manuf to building of the robot if fully assembled is about two months. Okay? Um, when the components actually turn up to actually um, assemble the, the components for a limb, takes about one week. So the assembly is about, about a month. The manufacturing, we don't manufacture in-house. We send, them, send the, the components out to be manufactured. That depends on, on how fast the machine shop does this. So it's not, it's not so, so labor-intensive, um, but it's more than a little. Um, and in terms of the scaling for that, the actual complexity it's in one of these robots is not so much. It's very, we think of it as very complex, but you compare it with a car. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the same level of complexity, maybe less. Um, and, and the way to actually think of it is, it's more like a Formula One car. Yeah, they're custom built for custom applications and therefore they're very expensive. But if you were to tool up to make a million of these a year, you would sell them for 10,000 because there's no reason why you couldn't. There's, there's nothing, there's, there's not significantly more complexity in this than there is even in the engine. The number of microprocessors in there is similar to, the, to a, a high-end car. The number of computers in there is similar. And the mechanical components, they're not, not dissimilar from a car. Um, the first question, sorry, it was... The easiest areas are ones which are very specific. 
So what you don't want is, is to say, ah, oh, we'd like a robot that does everything. So what you want is somebody, um, particularly high, uh, dangerous applications. Um, what you want to do is to go into a chemical plant to do something. You want to go into uh, a nuclear facility to do something. You want to be able to, to go into, and, and what you want is very specifically to know what the robot will do. To teach a robot, okay, so, so the case of teaching the robot to open the door took about six weeks to actually do. The valve turning was about four weeks. To teach it a new trick takes about a month at this moment in time. You can see from the, the part of the reason we do the teleoperation is that if you actually have, the, 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 part of the reason they take a month to actually do is because they have to be semi-autonomous. If you've got complete teleoperation, then you saw what you actually do is it just copies you. And there's a pretty good copying backwards and forwards. Um, so depending on, on the scenario, you could just teleoperate that robot remotely. And then what you want to do is to find something that's unsafe for a person to actually do. You don't want it to, you know, just go into a nursing home and take care of people. That's, that's just way too far in the future. So once you've got that skill, yeah. it's, it's, it's got that, yeah. Yeah, but, but for any handle, it's, it's, it's similar. I mean, it's, it's a bit like when, you, when a child learns. The first time it learns, it's difficult, then, then it refines it with time. So I have a, <clears throat> a philosophical question. Those of us that work with robots um, always laugh when we use movies to demonstrate how they work because you can, cause film is now cheap. Yeah. And so you can repeat your task over and over again until it works once and then make the movie and say, aha, it works. So my question is, when you show us one of these demonstrations, what percentage of the time did it actually work? That's okay. the first question. Okay. I'll, I'll, okay. If you look at the, the high, I don't know, have any of you been to IIT? Okay. Have any of you seen the Haiku demo? Okay. Did, was it specially prepared for you? Now, HiQ, Hi if, if I walked down to HiQ tomorrow and asked them to do the demo, they'd run the demo. It, it, it almost always works out of the box. Okay, the one that they run might not be, so they might not do the pipe. Um, they might not do the leg lifting, but they will put it onto a treadmill, press a button, and it will go. I mean, it, it works 90, 95% of the time, it's, it's very rare. The only time it doesn't is when they're doing an upgrade. It's, it's very reliable, extremely reliable, I would say, touch wood. The other one, um, the Kuman, the Kuman mostly works. So, so the video you saw of the valve turning, I think may have been taken at the um, European Robotics Forum meeting in Rovereto. Um, so it's a um, little bit north of here. Okay, and that was a two or three day event and the robot sat there for two or three days and during the two or three days, it just did the demos over and over and over again. So for two or three days, it ran the demos. The, the HiQ was at a, an event here in Milan two, three months, uh, two, three months ago and every, once every hour, it ran a 15 minute demo for three days. Um, so it, it's not reliable like um, you expect commercial products to be out of a box but I think it's much more reliable than you would expect of laboratory prototypes so, so in I both have, cases. So I was particularly interested in the door opening demonstration. Yeah. So how much of that was explicit stepwise programming and how much of it was uh, learned, autonomous, generalizable? We try to avoid deliberately telling the robot what to do. So the robot um, is looking for certain things. The, the robot is looking for the center of rotation. It knows to look for a door handle but it looks for the center of rotation. So you don't tell it where the center of rotation is. You, it, has to find the center, it has to find the door handle, it has to find the center of rotation, work out the center of rotation itself. It's got to work out where the center of rotation, the, the axis of the door is. It's got to work all of it. So it has algorithms to identify the door handle, it has algorithms to grasp the door handle, it has algorithms to turn the door ha handle, but nobody tells it what to do. What it does is it sends to the operator saying, I want to do this, and the operator says, yeah, go ahead. So because it's, it can be teleoperated, we allow, we allow it to communicate backwards. But that's just because we allow it in that particular instance. It doesn't have to. OK, it's my turn. Um, I have a, a, a question concerning uh, your list. Uh, sorry, yes. 
it's my turn? Yes. Okay. So you, in the beginning, you uh, showed us these uh, lists of advantages and disadvantages of the different actuators. Yeah. Um, these are comparisons between, between uh, uh, electrical systems, electrical actuators, and uh, hydraulic actuators. Now, seen from the point of view of a biologist, I would like to add another important disadvantage is the both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and this concerns, when you look at the walking uh, uh, robots that you have shown, the stride length or step size or step amplitude, whatever you would like to call it. If you look at these robots and compare this with that, what living machines do, what living systems do, it's about 10% or maybe 20% of step size. So it's incredibly more, incredibly worse compared to what animals can do. And the question is now, why is it the case? Is it depends that on the on the actuators? So my impression was it's even worse in hydraulic actuators compared to electrical actuators, or is there another reason? Uh, it's it's partly to do. Oh, okay, it, it, there's a there's a variety of, of instances. It's partly to do with the speed. If you're going relatively slow, you don't take big strides. I'm able to, but you don't take big strides. Yeah, no, but the, the robots the robots are able to do. One of the, okay, with the humanoid robot, the, the stride size is most limited by the foot. And what actually happens is it has a solid foot and we have toes, yeah? And because of this solid foot, we try to keep it parallel with the ground, right? But this limits the rotation on the ankle. And therefore, there's a limit to how far we can step forward because of this ankle. And this happens primarily because we have no toe. In a human, we do that. We have this, flex this extra degree of flexibility, which comes from the toes, which nobody actually, uh, uh, people talk about it. In actual fact, the robot we have has got a toe, but it's then put inside a solid foot, a solid shoe. But the toes add a lot to what's going on. We have some videos where you actually see the robot walking. What it does is it copies a person walking and when you actually see it walking, it does, it does this, it does, a, it does a lift, and then it does a second lift from its knees. And the reason it does that is because it's physically copying what the toes do, even though it's got no, it's got no toe. The toe is one of the things, it, that's what limits in the humanoid. That's the, the biggest limitation on the step size, not anything else. In the quadruped, the biggest limitation is probably the flexibility in the spine. Yes? So if you look at the robot, like the, the wild, wildcat robot, it's got a really, the cheetah robot, they have flexible spines, and the legs go out almost forwards and backwards. These robots don't have flexible spines. So we, we don't, so if you actually imagine taking a, um, a dog or whatever, put it in a solid, and then say how far forward can you move your joints? Because if you actually look at the range of motion, the robot has a wider range of motion than you get in most animals. But yet, excuse me, but yet it doesn't, reach for it. and the reason is because it hasn't got this, it hasn't got this ability in its spine. And it's, it's partly to do with flexibility in the foot, partly to do with flexibility in, in the spine, which at this moment in time are not, are critical, but yeah, you're right. Okay, so thank you for, for this uh, presentation and thank you for the, the audience for the question, thank you.